Thank you all for coming to our first virtual table talk of the year. Um, this year's theme is representation matters, and we're really excited to hear from a diverse selection of um, professionals and organizations, um, including today's speaker, Dee Dee Baldwin. We're very excited to have her. Dee Dee has been the history librarian at Mississippi State University since 2017. From 2007 to 2017, she worked in the library's manuscripts division. Um, she's also a past president and current board member of the Society of Mississippi Archivists. And we're really excited to have her. If you guys have any questions, um, the chat is open. You can put them in there and um, we can answer them at the end. So I'm just gonna hand it over to Dee Dee. Okay, thanks Miranda. And thanks for coming everybody. Um, I've been really excited to do this talk because this class was one of the greatest experiences of my life. The kids were awesome, and I'm just really excited to talk about the class and what we did. Okay, if I can get it to go to the next, there we go. So, first of all, what is Governor's School? For those who don't know, uh, the Mississippi Governor's School was started in the 80s. And it's a free residential program for gifted high school students from across the state. It's hosted at the Mississippi University for Women in Columbus. And the students stay in dorms on campus. Um, all of their food is covered. Everything's free. And they attend these classes. They sign up for the ones that sound the most interesting to them. And this year they had two classes a day. They had a three hour morning class and then a three hour afternoon class, which as you can imagine is pretty rough for high school students, but these are good kids who want to be there. So they really stick with you. And it kind of helped that I kept them well supplied with Cheez-Its and candy and you know stuff like that. You can see on the, on the table here in the picture, there's a box of granola bars up there. That's just because we had run out of Cheez-Its that day. Um, so this is my class that you're seeing here. And let's get into what we did. So, first of all, um, I based the class that I proposed around um, a website that I created that I think a lot of you already know about against all odds. It's about the black men who were served as legislators in the 19th century in Mississippi. So it covers the years 1870 to 1894, which is when the last two uh, left office and the site gives information about these men. Um, so there's like an alphabetical list and then there's like a little information page for each man. And it includes um, a bunch of newspaper clippings as much as I could find for each man. And all of these newspaper clippings are transcribed and cross linked to any of the legislators that they mention. So the site is really designed for anyone who wants to find information about these men or do primary source research about them to have everything about them that I'm able to find in one place. So I proposed a class to introduce more, um, more of Mississippi's high school students to these men because most of their names are not known. Um, if students are very lucky, they hear about, you know, um, Hiram Revels or Blanche K. Bruce. Every now and then you might run into somebody who knows who John R. Lynch is, and that's just really depressing. And um, so there's those major figures, but there's also just a ton of just men who aren't as well known, but they still led these incredible lives. And so I wanted to make people more aware of who they were. So the way the class was set up, it was two weeks. And so that's 10 weekdays of um, a three hour session each day. So I've, I've sort of organized this presentation just to take you through what we did each day. Um, and this was a first time experience for me. I've taught a first year experience class at MSU before, but that was only one hour once a week. Um, so it wasn't a whole lot. And besides that, all I had done really were these one shot library instruction sessions that a lot of us are familiar with where you're you know spending an hour with a class showing them how to use databases and things like that and i've taught workshops and things like that but as far as a really intensive um three hours a day every day for 10 days class i had never done anything like that before so one of my learning curves um with this experience was learning how to pace and learning how to plan um 
uh, what you're going to do each day, what's a good cutoff, um, things like that, that regular teachers, I think, know a little bit more about. So on day one of the class, we did sort of your, you know, standard introductions and icebreakers and things like that. And their first real activity in the class was I handed out these um, passages that I had selected from old textbooks of Mississippi history. And they ranged from, I think the earliest one was from the 19 teens. It might've been 1915. Um, and then the most recent was, um, 1973 and that would be Mississippi conflict and change that was the textbook that James Lowen did that really um, started teaching Mississippi history right tried to correct some mythology. Um, so they spent this first day comparing passages from these various textbooks through the years and just looking at how the textbooks covered reconstruction. Um, what was the narrative about whether Reconstruction was a positive time or a negative time, um, how were the Black legislators discussed, um, how were people like, quote, quote, carpetbaggers covered. So I just wanted them to see um, sort of the biases and the point of view that these textbook writers had. Um, so they paired up and just kind of based on where they were sitting. And then I passed out, um, uh, a textbook, a set of, you know, a packet of papers that had excerpts from each book and the students went through it and then they rotated through each one um, and took notes on kind of, you know, really standout quotes that they might have seen, things like that. Um, one of the things I learned from this session, and I think one or two of the students mentioned it in their final evaluation, they found this exercise a little bit repetitive <laughs> because so many of the textbooks had um, they, they 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 all had kind of the same negative until you got to the 1973 book. The other five textbooks were all kind of like Reconstruction was bad and it was kind of like just reading that over and over and over. Um, so if I do this activity again in the future, which I do plan to propose this class again in the future because I had such a good time teaching it. Um, I'm, I'll probably edit this activity to maybe not have every group look at every single textbook passage selection um, and just kind of break those up a little bit. Um, so these are just some samples of what they saw in a couple of these older textbooks. Um, the one on the left has passages from Lowry, Kincannon, and Lowry. Uh, that was Mississippi, a historical reader. That's a 1937 book. And I'm not going to read these aloud. You can kind of get an idea of what they say. Um, but just a sample, the thing which aroused the resentment of the white people was not race hatred, nor an enmity against their former slaves. You know, it's typical lost cause mythology. And, you know, um, there was no racism. Everything was nice. And then on the right side, this is um, this is a little passage and an illustration from, to me, what was the worst of the books. This was Guyton's Our Mississippi from 1952. To me, this one had some of the worst passages just glossing over the truth of what really happened. Um, so you can see a little clip of this passage. It says, most Northerners knew little about the Negroes and thought that once the black men were free, they would be able to take care of themselves just as white men did. So obviously horrible. Um, and you can see also the illustration at the top um, and the name of the chapter is the problems of reconstruction. So right away, the attitude is very clear. And there we go. On the second day of the class, Oh, let me go back and say one more thing on that first day of class after we did the textbook analysis. I also did a PowerPoint, um, sort of a very general overview of what Reconstruction in Mississippi was, like what was going on. We talked about um, the 1868 Constitution. We talked about the 14th and 15th Amendments. It was just a very general overview of the events leading up to these Black men taking office. On the second day of class, I showed them a YouTube video of an event that was held at the Department of Archives and History that some of you might have gone to. I went to it. It was really cool. Um, 
It was held at the Capitol on the 150th anniversary of Hiram Revel's election. And um, Eric Foner, who's like probably the top reconstruction scholar in the nation, he gave a really good keynote speech about that. And you can see from the screenshot of the video, some familiar faces to us. There's Pamela Jr., Katie Blunt, you know. So they watched that speech and it's about an hour long. And this is another thing that I would probably change if I teach the class again. Uh, I think it was very hard for them to sit through that hour long video of a guy talking. Um, for future class sessions, I've learned since doing the class that the Zen Education Project, they've done like a really great um, reconstruction or a report on how reconstruction is taught. And their website includes all kinds of classroom activities. And I plan to kind of mine those and try to find some more interactive things to do with the class on this particular day. Um, but the students did think it was cool that they could see me in the video at the end, like when, it, when everybody stands up and claps, you can see like a little redhead in the audience and they're like, there you are. You know, high school kids are easily amused. <laughs> so there was that. Um, and then after we watched that video, we did an overview of the two um, national senators, that would be Hiram Revels and Blanche K. Bruce. We went over who those men were. And then we did some primary source reading from John R. Lynch's autobiography. And the passage that I had printed out for them to read was the, um, the section from his very early life about how he and his brother, William, who was also a legislator, they were born in Louisiana to a white Irish man and an enslaved mother. And there was, it's kind of this whole dramatic story about how um, the white man wanted to free them, but uh, he couldn't because they wouldn't be allowed to stay in the state because Mississippi had similar laws. There were all these laws about how free um, free people of color weren't allowed to stay in the state. So it was all this legal mess. And then the Irish man was dying and he asked a friend to quote, quote, enslave his, um, I don't want to call her his wife, but um, the Lynch's mother, we don't know her name, um, and the two sons, but not really have them be slaves to just have them called his slaves you know so all that legal mess but then his friend went on to actually treat them as slaves so it was this whole complicated thing and the students were really interested in it um i read it aloud to them they um i i, I quickly picked up that they preferred when i read things aloud than when i just gave them stuff and said here read this so i ended up reading a lot of stuff aloud um because almost every day in this class I would print out examples of newspaper clippings that talked about some of the men we were covering each day. And so um, I, I would read aloud a lot of these things just because the students liked it. And they really liked that passage from John R. Lynch's autobiography, especially. On the third day of the class, we went right into the legislature of 1870. We had covered all the background material leading up to that. Um, and I did a PowerPoint presentation of the senators. I forget how many there were, but it was probably around six um, in that first legislature. Six of the senators were black men. Um, that included Charles Caldwell, who's pictured here. Um, and this slide includes um, just some quotes about him. And so I, I did a presentation on the senators. And then for the representatives, I wanted it to be more interactive. So. They had a list of men's names to choose from. I went through and picked some of the men who were most prominent and had more materials about them. And then I gave them a list of men to choose from and they went up to the computer lab in our building and they kind of poked around on my website and looked at who sounded most interesting to them. I told them that they could either pair up or work individually because some people like group work and some people like to work alone. Um, so I gave them gave them that option. And then each pair or person would pick which figure they wanted to cover. And they took a piece of poster board. And then I had bought like markers and construction paper and various very basic crafting materials. And they had to put together a presentation for the class uh, about the figure that they chose. 
So they had a lot of fun doing that. And these are just pictures of them putting together that first presentation that they did. Um, up in the top left corner, you can see one of these guys really liked to draw pictures. And so he illustrated their poster for some of them, um, like right beneath him, that's Isabel. And she actually printed out some of the newspaper clippings about her guy and put them directly on her poster. She really liked primary sources. So that was that was cool. Um, up at the top, you can see other other kids working on their posters. This is Rachel. This is um, Addie. And I can't tell who that is on the floor. Um, actually, that might. I don't know who that is. I can't tell, but they really had fun doing these because it gave them a chance to kind of escape just sitting there listening to me talk and they could kind of sprawl out on the floor and relax and chat with each other while they worked on it. So it was kind of a little bit of a break from just listening to me lecture. And then they seem to all enjoy presenting their projects as well. Um, this one at the bottom is about Isaac and Mary Shad. Um, this was Marianne Shad Carey. Some of you might have heard of her before. She was a major figure. Uh, she was a journalist and newspaper editor, and she was actually way more famous than her brother. And so I suggested to the student who chose Isaac Shad that she also cover Mary Ann Shad Carey. And so she did that. Um, and then here you can see um, you can see Amber and Rachel presenting their poster on James Aaron Moore. They ended up presenting on the next class day. So on day four, we had a visit from two of my very good colleagues from the U.S. Grant Presidential Library. You'll see in the top left, that's Ryan Sims, and bottom left, David Nolan. They were kind enough to drive over to Columbus because we weren't able to take, I really wanted to take a field trip and take them to the Presidential Library and let them work there in person on these primary sources, but that wasn't possible. So Ryan and David drove over to the W. And they brought over materials, uh, primary source groups of documents for each student to kind of examine and see what they had. Um, one of the kids had a copy of a letter that John R. Lynch wrote, and so she actually got to work on transcribing, and she was really good at it. Um, they say some high school kids now can't read cursive, but she was doing really great transcribing letters, and she she was planning to go to Ole Miss, and I told her when she got up there she needed to talk to the archivist and see if they needed her to transcribe some stuff because she was good at it. Um, and then there were other types of primary sources as well that uh, Ryan and David brought over. Another thing they did was Ryan gave kind of um, a background on reconstruction nationally. Um, on the first day of class, I had, I had given a background on reconstruction just in Mississippi. And so Ryan gave kind of a really good national overview for context. And then David talked about working with primary sources and also documentary editing, just some of the work that um, people who work with primary sources have to do. He talked about the annotations they made for the book and how sometimes you have to decide what is meant in a document. Sometimes you have to pick which documents are quote, quote, important and which ones are not. And um, the students were really interested in that. They asked a ton of questions and then, um, at the end of the class, overall, on the last day of the class, I gave them kind of an, a personal evaluation that I wanted to see which of the classroom activities they enjoyed the most. And this was one of the things that really stood out to them. They really liked this session. On day five, they had a virtual presentation and a chance to ask questions of a descendant of one of the legislators. Her name's Karen Birch. Um, and some of you might have been at the presentation I did with her last year on virtual table talks. She and another one of the descendants joined me and we talked about um, some of their ancestors. But Karen Birch is a descendant of George Washington Albright. He was a figure who later moved to California and his descendants eventually helped their Japanese neighbors during the period of the internment camps in World War II. And she just has a really great story. She has tons of pictures of her family. So this was a really interesting session to me. Um, the kids seem to kind of, I think that they were getting tired of virtual stuff, but that's just kind of what we had to do, um, given the limits of, you know, what you have to do in a class. Um, and unfortunately, Karen doesn't live close enough to be there in person. She lives all the way out in California. Um, 
in the future, if I'm ever able to find descendants who could come in person, I think that would be extremely effective. Um, but for now, I still think it's effective to have actual descendants of these men come in and talk about them from a personal point of view. Day six of the class, this was the Monday of the second week. Day six was their favorite day of the class by far. Um, I think they just enjoyed getting out of the classroom, getting off campus, getting to do something different. Um, and for, for those of you who know Chuck Yarborough, he's a really great teacher. He works at MSMS and uh, he's, he's been there for so long that he taught me. So we're both very old. Um, and actually I was in the first class that he taught at MSMS. It was both of our first year there. Um, so he's a great teacher and we went to this Sandfield Cemetery in Columbus. This is their historic African-American cemetery there. Um, and MSMS under the leadership of Chuck, they do um, that annual 8th of May emancipation celebration that a lot of you probably know about um, where they, some of the students dress up and they reenact the stories of some of the people who were buried in the cemetery, including um, these two legislators at the top. Robert Gleed um, was a state senator and Jesse Freeman Bolden was a representative both from Lowndes County and they're both buried there in that cemetery. And um, in various years, the students, sometimes the student will portray Robert Gleed. This past year, um, a girl portrayed his daughter who was a teacher. So they usually find their ways into the 8th of May program. So Chuck gave them a tour of the cemetery. He talked about um, Gleed and Bolden, and he also talked about some of the other prominent uh, African-American Columbus figures who are buried there. And again, the students loved this on the evaluation I gave them at the end of the course. Just about everybody said this was their favorite thing. And um, they mentioned throughout the remainder of the week how much they loved that cemetery visit. <laughs> so this, yeah, this was a fun day, even though it was super hot. Um, but Chuck was nice enough to lead us into shade for ev everywhere he stopped to talk. He made sure it was in the shade. <laughs> And uh, this is just our nice group picture um, at the grave of Jesse Bolden. That's the entire class and then Chuck on the far right. So day seven of the class was, I thought it would be the hardest day because we were talking about really difficult subject matter this day. Um, we were getting into white resistance to, um, to reconstruction and black leadership. We were talking about the Clinton massacre of 1875, and we were talking about um, three legislators that we know of that were murdered. There could have been more. I just I have not been able to find how or when those legislators died. But these there's these three legislators that we know were murdered. Um, there's Charles Caldwell. He's um, remembered with a historical marker in Clinton. You can see that on the right. That's a picture I took of downtown Clinton. Um, there was William Henderson Foote in Yazoo County. He was a, um, he collected taxes for um, liquor sales. And so he, he was murdered. He was falsely accused, most likely falsely accused of murdering someone. And he was attacked and shot in his jail cell. And then there was James Patterson. Um, that's the newspaper clippings you see on the left. James Patterson was taken out and lynched. Um, and the really heartbreaking story about Patterson is that it's reported um, his last words basically were that he had some money in his pocket and he asked the men who were lynching him to send it to his sisters back in Ohio because he was responsible for taking care of them. And the newspaper that reported this also reported that um, one of the leaders of the lynch mob was seen the next week or something like that in a brand new carriage. So basically that they just took his money. They didn't send it to his sisters. Um, and the two newspaper clippings on the left were actually, I actually gave these to the students together because I wanted them to compare the newspaper coverage. The newspaper clipping on the far left is from a white newspaper and the newspaper clipping on the right that's in the middle of your screen there this was how the event was reported in a Republican newspaper. 
and I wanted the students to notice the difference in how the event was covered from um, from the two very different points of view. And we did a lot of that in the class. Whenever we looked at these primary sources, you know, we would look at which newspaper was reporting the story and whether it was a mainstream white newspaper like the Clarion Ledger or whether it was something from the Mississippi Weekly Pilot, which tended to be um, much more sympathetic to Republican or um, what they called radical um, coverage. So on day eight of the class, I asked the students if they wanted me to cover the second set of legislators in a PowerPoint presentation or if they wanted to do their own presentations again. And it was unanimous that they wanted to do their own. Nobody wanted to listen to me talk. Um, and I respect that. So um, I got some more poster boards and they did presentations again. I put together another list for them to choose from and um, they paired up. Everybody chose to work with a partner this time and they researched on the site and they made their posters. Um, you can see in the picture on the right side with uh, Ben and Naomi's presentation, they happened to cover a figure for whom I was able to find an actual campaign poster. And you can see that in the bottom left corner of their poster that sort of, it's a smaller version obviously, but um, that came from the Schomburg Center in New York. They actually have some of Cornelius Jones's materials including, like I said, the only um, campaign poster that I've been able to find for any of these men. And they printed it out and put it on their poster, which I thought was great. I encouraged them the second time around to follow Isabel's example that she had done in the first round of printing out newspaper articles and getting into the primary sources. And so you can see they um, all the students did more of an effort on that. This is Isabel and Amber. They part up, partnered up for the second round. And you can see on their poster, they printed out a couple of newspaper clippings. So on the ninth day of class, this was the day before last day of the class. Um, I wanted the students to do individual creative projects. In a couple of cases, I had a couple of students that wanted to work together, so I let them. Um, but for the most part, the students did their own individual projects, and I told them they could do almost anything they wanted. They could write a poem, they could do artwork, um, they could do a like a poster board type presentation. Um, one of the suggestions I did was that they could write a letter to their local newspaper about why they think their county should have a historical marker um, for the first black legislators in their county. And so some of them took those suggestions. Some of them did their own thing. You can see in the, um, at, well, at the top here, this little, where it says the story of Charles Caldwell, that was a little miniature storybook that one of the guys did. Um, and he illustrated just about every page and he wrote it out like a little storybook. Um, Charles Caldwell really stood out to the students. I think especially to the guys that were in the class. Um, for those that don't know, Charles Caldwell was murdered in, uh, not in the Clinton riot, but as a result of it, um, towards the end of 1875, he was murdered in December. Um, he was shot and there's this really dramatic report of his death where he had been shot some, but he was still alive and he walked out and he was wearing one of those long, big coats that men used to wear back then. And he came out and held the coat open um, to the people who were attacking him, and, you know, just walked out there. And it's, you can see it in your head as a, this very cinematic moment, you know, walking out there holding his coat open, like, come on and get me, you know. Um, and so another, it's not on this slide, but another one of the guys did artwork of that moment, like showing Caldwell holding his coat open. Um, on the right side, this is a collage that Addie, Addie made. Um, of newspaper clippings about violence. And she did drawings of some of the legislators who suffered from that violence. And I just love this collage. I have it hanging in my office now. And then on the bottom left here, uh, <laughs> this is Winnie and Michelle. They, um, <laughs> they put together this poster that was sort of a summary of both the class and some of the things they learned. So on the left side of the poster, they had pictures of us doing some of the things in the class. 
And then on the right side, they had some of the legislators that stood out to them the most. Um, if you're wondering why there's a bag of Cheez-Its taped to the poster board, that's because it kind of became a thing with our class that we loved Cheez-Its. And I, I ended up buying, you know, those big, huge boxes with like 20 bags of Cheez-Its or something. I ended up buying like four of those over the course of the two weeks because those students just put them away. Um, I feel sorry for those of y'all who have to feed teenagers. That's all I have to say about that. Um, so, yeah, I was really, really happy with these final creative projects. One of the students, um, Amber, actually um, took the suggestion of writing a letter to her local paper. I don't think I convinced her to actually send it. I, I really wish she had. I think that would have been cool. But she did that. Um, one of the students wrote a poem, and I'm going to share that with you all later. Um, several of the students chose to write poems, and um, a lot of them illustrated their poems as well. But yeah, I was really, really happy with these creative projects. And then on the final day of the class, they had a virtual um, question and answer session with some members of the Mississippi Legislative Black Caucus. I really wanted to tie together the past and the present. So I contacted um, Angela Turner Ford, who's the chairwoman of the caucus, and she arranged for um, a few of her colleagues to join us. So along with um, Senator Turner Ford, we had Chet Taylor, who's um, our local representative, we had Senator John Horn, who I believe was from Madison County, um, and two of my students were from Med Madison County, and they were really proud to see him there because he was very matter of fact about his opinions on things, and they loved it. Um, and then we also had Tracy Rosebud, who unfortunately I don't remember uh, what part of the state he was from, but he was from the House of Represent the State House of Representatives. And then also on day 10, um, when we were done with this Q&A session, the students did, um, they presented their final creative projects. So I wanted to close with Naomi reading her poem. The name of the class was Radical Courage. And so that's what she titled her poem. Um, Governor's School as a whole had an open mic night, um, I think like on the middle of the second week. And the students could do pretty much get up and do pretty much anything they wanted. There was a whole lot of funny dancing and uh, singing and lip syncing. It was just a big old party time, basically. And at the very end, um, some of her classmates and I talked Naomi into getting up there and sharing her poem. She was really nervous about doing it, but I think she did a great job. And so I wanted to close with her reading this. So I'm just going to hope this works here. I hope y'all can hear this. It sounds like y'all can't hear it. Carrie is telling me in the chat that she can't hear it. Let's see. Upload it directly to WebEx. Is there a link to the video we could do individually? Um, I will be sharing a link in a minute to um, all of the class files are on a Google Drive. Um, so y'all could go see it on there. Oh, I'm really disappointed that that didn't work, but um, it's just a short little video. And if you're interested, I'll show you where to find it on the Google Drive. Oh. So um, that's all for my presentation. This is a selfie that we took on the last day of class, um, showing all my babies there. And um, if you're interested in emailing me, there's my email address. And like I said, I have a Google Drive that contains all of the class files. It's also linked on my Against All Odds website, um, but in, it includes a ton of photos from the class. It has um, all of the articles that I chose for each day of the class. It has um, It has some of the activities that we did. It's just sort of a full archive of everything I did for the class. 
So you can, uh, including Naomi's poem, it's there. There's a folder called videos and her, po her, her poem is in there, her reading her poem. Um, so does anybody have any questions? have one dd um what strategies would you suggest to us who who are um teaching with hard history um to students how do you how do you help the students navigate those especially students that may be resisting resistant to acknowledging hard history um do you have any advice on that i'm really glad you asked that because there was something i forgot to say um on the class the day that we covered all the violence with the, the murders and the Clinton massacre, that ended up being a really short class day because material that I had thought would take up the whole class didn't. That goes back to me having problems with pacing. Um, and so we ended up for like the last third of the class just goofing off and talking and um, they wanted me to show them a bunch of my old Facebook photos. They really liked photos of me doing stuff with Starkville Community Theater. Um, and so I would say if you're covering hard topics, first of all, just embrace that, just that maybe it would be good just to not dwell on it too much and let the kids have a break after. Um, but also when I first introduced that particular class session, well, let me back up. Before we even got to that day, I had put on their course outline a note that we would be covering hard topics that day. And then on the day itself, I told them, if you need to step out, just step out. We're going to be covering hard stuff today. Um, this is really difficult material and they handled it very well. And I think that they really welcomed sort of the. The more lighthearted break that we had afterwards at 1st, I felt kind of bad about it because I felt like I had wasted class time. But then I found out from other instructors that they don't just teach every single minute of every single class. Um, so, and then I felt a little bit better about it and, um, as far as being resistant to certain topics, that wasn't something that came up in this particular class. Um, they might, some of the students might've been thinking it silently. I don't know, but in general, they all seemed to just know that, yeah, we're talking about things that are true here. We're confronting, um, true history. And I think that when they're, when you look at the primary sources, they kind of speak for themselves really it's not just a teacher up there telling them this is what happened they were reading it for themselves in the primary sources so like i said they kind of speak for themselves i hope that answered your question i have i guess more of a comment than a question but i love the idea of you starting off the class um having them look at old textbooks and stuff because those are wild. <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, they are. And I'm, I'm curious, like once they had gotten through the class, did any of them, you know, make comments comparing what they learned to, you know, the textbook, uh, the textbook clippings and things that they had looked at in the beginning? Yeah, we sort of did that. We, um, on the last day of class, when we were sort of wrapping up the class and everything, um, I asked them to think back about how some of those textbooks had covered certain topics, especially the Clinton massacre, because on the very first day of class, before they knew what all of this stuff even was, there there might not have been as much context in their heads, if that makes sense, about um, what they were actually reading. And it actually makes me think that the textbook exercise might work better towards the end of the class rather than on the first day. So. Yeah, we we did talk about it briefly at the end of the class, like going back and saying, so now that you know what this is, do you have any more thoughts on how the, the old textbooks covered it? You know, um, Carrie said she's curious about how this class compares to what they have learned in school about this topic. Um, it's always tricky to ask teenagers, have y'all talked about this in school? Because sometimes they have and they just forgot that they have, you know? Um, but these were like, especially good kids. And I think that 
I think I, I this sounds bad, but I sort of trust them more about what they have learned in school. Um, I think some of them had heard of Hiram Rebels. None of them had heard of John R. Lynch. Um, schools in general don't spend a lot of time on reconstruction, which is part of the reason that the Zen Education Project did their reconstruction report. Um, and I recommend um, you can go on their website and request a free copy of this. It's like their little. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong thing. I picked up my thing from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. This is their report. It's called um, Erasing the Black Freedom Struggle, How State Standards Fail to Teach the Truth About Reconstruction. And you can go to the Zen Education Project's website and request a free copy, or you can just read it on their website. They have a PDF of the report. Um, but yeah, like it, it's such a problem about reconstruction not being taught well, and this isn't just Mississippi, this is nationally, um, that they did a report on it. It's just something that they tend to skip from like the Civil War, just kind of skip Reconstruction or just gloss over it. Um, in some places, I think I think it's still taught that, um, that it was a negative period. Um, I had Mississippi studies in the 90s, and I remember being left with the impression that Reconstruction was a negative period in American history, corrupt, you know, um, turmoil and corruption, basically, um, as opposed to a radical experiment in civil rights that was betrayed, essentially, when the country just said, this isn't important enough to stand up for, and it was just let go. Um, Addie had been, um, had, had, had reconstruction covered pretty well because she's an MSMS student and Chuck Yarbrough is her history teacher. So I think she had been taught pretty well about reconstruction. Um, but yet the rest of them hadn't really been taught anything about it at all. I was a little jealous because when I was in uh, high school, I didn't get the opportunity to deal with any primary sources and, you know, do all the analysis and stuff. So I think it's really great that we're like starting them off early. <laughs> so to they speak. really like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that sometimes, um, you know, you, you do have to be careful when you're dealing with teenagers and whatnot and the development of brains and all that. <laughs> but I do think that, that there are things that in the past we've shied away from allowing them to do and allowing them to learn that they really can handle pretty well if we just give them the opportunity. So absolutely. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I didn't think that they'd be able to read some of the handwriting when Ryan and David came over with the, some of the grant primary sources. I was like, oh, they're not gonna be able to read that. And she was just reading it just fine. Right. Um, I wanted, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about against all odds and like, is that's an ongoing project, correct? Or is that something that you pretty much yeah. wrapped up? <laughs> it's, it's ongoing. I'm always trying to find new stuff for it. Like there are some men that I've just never been able to find anything else about. And every now and then I'll say, hmm, I'm going to go try again to find information about so-and-so and I'll spend an hour researching the census and the newspapers to see if I there's some search term I missed that would bring them up. Um, sometimes people email me things that they have found. So yeah, it is ongoing. Whenever I find something new, I add it to the site. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if any of the kids showed interest in helping with that. I mean, do you like allow like, um, not allow, but <laughs> um, do you, you know, have people kind of helping you transcribe and things or is that something you just do on your own? I've always done it on my own, but if somebody wanted to, I would be open to it. Um, none of the students, I don't know if they just thought it wasn't an option or they might have thought that the site was kind of finished for the most part, but none of them like said anything like, hey, I want to work on this. Yeah. Yeah. I was they might have if they knew it was a, an option, I don't know. Yeah. I was just thinking since, you know, you had allowed them to look at, um, primary sources and things, if any of them had shown any interest in maybe going into the archives or historian field or, you know, helping with something like that. If this was, you know, an eye-opening moment for the, any of them. <laughs> they were really sad that they didn't get to go to the Grant Library in person. Um, 
they were really interested in seeing the museum and um I think they would have embraced any chance really to leave the classroom and the campus <laughs> um but also they were just genuinely interested in um in visiting that um I also mentioned to them that I had hoped I'd be able to take them to the Civil Rights Museum in Jackson um and they were like oh yeah we wish we could have done that but you know but yeah they were very interested in just archives in general and they were especially surprisingly to me interested in the process of documents like editing documents that David talked about that's cool <laughs> and um governor's school I think the applications to be an instructor go up in November so if there's ever a topic that any of y'all are really interested in or you just want to maybe teach a class of really interested high school students how to use primary sources in general maybe consider proposing a class um i live close enough to the w where i could just drive over there every day um but they also have free housing for instructors um melinda is saying in the chat she's in charge of governor school she's saying in the chat that november 15th is when the instructor applications will go live and you'll be getting one from me melinda um but so yeah this time of year is when you can apply to be an instructor and instructors can stay for free on campus in a dorm and all of your meals are covered so i would i would work the first half of the day at work here in starkville and then i would drive over and eat a free lunch in the cafeteria and teach my class and then i would stay and eat the free supper and then i would drive back home to starkville and if you know any students melinda saying in, in the chat that the student applications go live on November 1st. So if you know any students who would benefit from governor's school, it's a wonderful program. Um, I did it in the summer of 1995 and really enjoyed it. Um, my class was on Southern literature. I don't remember who taught it, but we learned about William Faulkner and, you know, some of the other big Southern writers. And I remember we took a field trip to Roanoke and Oxford and it was really cool. So governor's school is a great program and they have classes on, you know, just a huge variety of subjects. Yeah, check out the link that Melinda posted in chat if you want to learn more about Governor's School. Does anybody have any other questions? <laughs> Melinda, what she's posting in the chat. <laughs> My students had this thing where every day when I entered the cafeteria, they would go, they would go, Miss Dede, they would like yell at me. And so that's what, <laughs> that's what she's referring to in the chat. I really loved these kids. It was a wonderful experience. All right, well, it looks like there's no more questions. So thanks everybody. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Didi. This was great. And thank you everyone for coming out and we'll see you next time. <laughs>